what's up, friend? Welcome back to the YouTube channel for the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather. I've been podcasting on Tudor England since 2009, making my show the oldest, the original Tudor History Podcast. So a couple of weeks ago, I did a podcast episode on William Cecil, and I wanted to dig into a little bit more of his life specifically the period after Edward died uh, under Mary I, in between Edward and Elizabeth. Because, of course, Cecil was a Protestant, so somehow he managed to survive the reign of Mary I. How did he do that? Let us talk about it. I'm so glad you're here with me for this conversation. Welcome, welcome, especially if you're new. I'm thrilled that you're here. I put out videos like this dealing with all aspects of Tudor England, on the regular. So if that sounds like something you'd like to see in your YouTube feed, why not hit subscribe right now? All right. William Cecil, later known as Lord Burley, is, of course, a pivotal figure in English history, especially known for his service under Queen Elizabeth I. However, his survival and maneuvering during the reign of Mary I, particularly around the 1553 succession crisis, demonstrates his remarkable political acumen. This period was marked by crazy amounts of intrigue, of shifting allegiances and alliances, and the desperate struggle for power, which Cecil managed to navigate with cautious precision. Edward VI died in 1553, and that started a major crisis in the English succession. Edward was, of course, a very staunch Protestant, and he wanted to prevent his Catholic half-sister Mary from ascending to the throne. That was what was in Henry VIII's original will, was that it would go from Edward, Edward's children, and if Edward didn't have any children, it would go to Mary and then to Elizabeth. And that was what Henry VIII had wanted in his will. So then Edward created a document known as his device for the succession, where he bypassed both Mary and his other half-sister Elizabeth, in favor of his Protestant cousin, Lady Jane Grey. Lady Jane Grey, of course, descended from the line of Henry VIII's sister, Mary, who had married Charles Brandon. And so Lady Jane Grey comes from that line. This decision was heavily influenced by John Dudley, who was the Duke of Northumberland and who conveniently was Jane's father-in-law and, of course, stood to gain immensely from her accession. So William Cecil's role during this turbulent time is actually shrouded in some mystery. At the very critical moment, Cecil was absent from court due to a combination of both personal illness and the death of his father. Cecil was very active with the court of Edward VI. He implemented many of Edward's Protestant policies, so he was very involved with, with court and he would have been there, but he was conveniently absent which distanced himself from the immediate kind of political swirl that was happening around Northumberland and Edward's inner circle. When he returned in May of 1553, Cecil found himself in a court fraught with tension and the looming prospect of Edward's imminent death. Approach to the succession crisis was marked by, of course, caution and a sense of self-preservation. Recognizing that the situation was very dangerous, he wanted to minimize his involvement. He avoided attending Privy Council meetings whenever he could. He was wary of being implicated in this potentially treasonous plot to alter the succession without parliamentary consent. On June 11th, 1553, Cecil's strategic avoidance was thwarted when he was obliged to attend a very critical council meeting. At this meeting, the legality of Edward's device was debated, contested, and the king, Edward, was desperate to see his will enacted. He demanded that the council support his plan. Lord Chief Justice Montague warned that implementing the device without an act of parliament would be treasonous. Despite his misgivings, Montague was coerced into drafting the document, underscoring the immense pressure that the council was under. Cecil, like his peers, eventually signed the document, albeit as a witness to the king's intention rather than an active supporter. That makes a difference. This was a subtle difference 
which would later become crucial in his defense. Edward died on July 6, 1553, and his death set in motion Lady Jane Grey's brief and very tragically ill-fated reign. Jane was proclaimed queen. Cecil found himself reluctantly drawn into her government. He signed a few key documents, including the proclamation of her accession, although he carefully avoided endorsing anything that was blatantly treasonous, any kind of correspondence that would have been clearly treasonous. Despite his outward compliance, Cecil worked covertly to undermine Jane's authority. He knew that Mary was supposed to be the queen, that Mary would be the queen, that this wasn't going to stand up in England, right? And, and it didn't. The people rallied around Mary, of course. So Cecil discreetly communicated his doubts and his concerns to influential figures like Sir William Peter and the Earls of Winchester, Fedford, and Arundel. These efforts to sow discord and prepare for a potential shift in power were part of Cecil's broader strategy to safeguard his position regardless of the outcome. The uprising in support of Mary quickly gained momentum, and by early August, Mary had secured enough support to move on to London. The swift collapse of Jane's regime left Cecil in a very dangerous position but his foresight and his strategic alliances, sowing the seeds early on as he had done, paid off for him. With Mary's triumph, Cecil acted swiftly to secure his safety. He allied himself with key figures like Sir William Peter and Nicholas Bacon, ensuring that he had influential advocates in the new regime. He sent detailed letters to Queen Mary defending his actions, emphasizing his reluctance to support Jane's coup. By presenting himself as a cautious, reluctant participant rather than an enthusiastic conspirator, Cecil managed to escape severe retribution. His defense, combined with the support of his allies, allowed Cecil to gradually reintegrate into the political landscape under Mary, laying the groundwork for his future prominence under Elizabeth. So he was able to navigate through one of these most dangerous periods of his career he emerged with his position somewhat intact. Now we're going to pause here for a second because I want to tell you about TudorCon Online. Um, online tickets are finally on sale. I know people have been asking me about them for a while. I wanted to wait until we were getting closer to TudorCon. September 20th to 22nd, TudorCon is happening for three days at Agecroft Hall in Richmond, Virginia. Now the in-person tickets are sold out. But we have a whole streaming experience, which is not just another Zoom call, right? So we have special entertainment just for streamers. We have extra speakers who are doing online-only talks. Um, the streamers are part of all the live activities. We have a host. It's my husband. He's adorable. He hosts the online event. So if you have questions for the speakers, the live speakers, you can interact and, and ask them. Um, it's a whole community of online people from around the world Super, super fun. And you also get recordings of everything. So you can go back and watch things if you can't make it live. Lifetime access to the recordings. You get a digital goodie bag with some cool digital art and ebooks, extra fun things. And it's an amazing value. So the tickets are $49. It's an amazing value. You get access to all of the talks, interaction with the speakers, all of that, all the entertainment. Um, you get the recordings of everything so you can watch from home whenever you want. Uh, for lifetime access, I'm just going to put them in a Dropbox folder and you can watch them whenever. Um, you get the digital goodie bag, all the community, all kinds of extra fun stuff for $49. It's a real deal. Honestly, it is such an amazing deal. I see other stuff that's priced so much more for similar sorts of things. And I really want to make this accessible for more people to be able to, be, to come to it, right? So $49 is the online ticket. And you can learn more at englandcast.com slash tutorcon online. That is englandcast.com slash tutorcon online. And I hope that we will see you sep September 20th to 22nd, I can talk, online uh, to englandcast.com slash tutorcon online to learn more and get your ticket. Also, if you enter the code early online, early online, you will save $10 off of your, off of your ticket. So code early online when you go to buy your ticket. And that's not going to last forever. I don't know how long I'm going to have that coupon code up, but it's for the early birds, which we are right now because it's about three months, three and a half months away. So if you want to get in and save a little bit of money, early online is your code. All right, let's get back into it. Commercial break over. 
Following Mary's ascent to the throne, William Cecil found himself initially excluded from public office, a consequence, of course, of his involvement, however reluctant, in the Lady Jane Grey plot. He retired to his estate in Wimbledon. He outwardly adopted a low profile, living quietly with his family. However, behind the scenes, he was far from inactive. He secretly supported opposition to Mary's government, leveraging his network to undermine the new regime's religious policies. He provided clandestine support for Protestant efforts, including backing a secret printing press operated by his brother-in-law, William Cook, which produced anti-government materials. This was like treasonous stuff, right? Despite his public conformity to Catholicism, his sympathies were firmly Protestant, and he had this delicate balancing act which helped him to maintain influence and connections without attracting undue attention. One of his most strategic associations during this time was with Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, the next in line to the throne. He served as the steward of Elizabeth's lands in Lincolnshire, ensuring that he remained in her good graces and he positioned himself very favorably for the future. He kind of knew what was he could tell. Mary was older, wasn't in the best health. He was just preparing himself. His path to rehabilitation under Mary began with a series of carefully executed acts of loyalty and service. In 1554, he was tasked with hosting Spanish envoys and then later escorting Cardinal Reginald Poole back to England. Cardinal Reginald Poole, of course, had been in exile because he spoke out against Henry VIII marrying Anne Boleyn, but he would become Archbishop of Canterbury and restore England to the Roman Catholic Church. Apparently, even though they had very different views from each other, Poole and Cecil actually got along really well and developed a mutual respect, which furthered Cecil's reintegration into public life. Gradually, he began to regain his political footing. He publicly conformed to the Catholicism practices. He attended mass and all the religious services while privately maintaining his Protestant beliefs. So his strategic conformity allowed him to navigate the treacherous political landscape without alienating his Protestant allies or attracting the ire of the Catholic regime. Cecil's political acumen was evident in Parliament. He opposed a government bill aimed at confiscating the lands of Protestant exiles. His opposition to this bill, which would have affected many of his friends and associates who were exiled in Switzerland and other places, demonstrated his continued commitment to the Protestant cause. The bill was ultimately defeated, showing his influence, the effectiveness of his political maneuvering. During Mary's reign, Cecil's personal life was intertwined with his political activities. His marriage to Mildred Cook, who was a member of a very prominent Protestant family, say that 10 times fast, further strengthened his network of influential connections. The Cecils endured personal tragedies, including the loss of their first child, Francis, shortly after birth. However, their second child, Anne, born in 1556, survived. As Mary's health declined, the anticipation of Elizabeth's succession grew. Cecil positioned himself for the impending change in power. He maintained regular contact with Elizabeth, ostensibly to discuss her estates, but also likely to plan for a future reign. Count Ferry, the Spanish ambassador, recognized Cecil's potential influence in the new regime, describing him as an able and virtuous man, albeit a heretic. This acknowledgement underscored Cecil's reputation and the expectation that he would play a significant role in Elizabeth's government. On November 17, 1558, both Queen Mary and Cardinal Pole died on the same day. There was an influenza outbreak, and they both succumbed at the same, at the, on the same day. Cecil was actually with Elizabeth at Hatfield on that day, planning for her future. So his survival during the reign of Mary I showcased his resilience and his cautious maneuvering, his alliances, his development of his self-preservation. All of this meant that he was able to navigate one of the most dangerous periods in English history for Protestant, and his ability to adapt to the changing landscapes while maintaining his core beliefs ensured his place as one of the most influential people of his time, ultimately serving as the chief architect of Elizabethan England. 
So that is all I have for you today on William Cecil. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video and made it to the end, I sure would appreciate a press of that like button. It helps to feed the algorithm and help this video reach more people. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, also, why not subscribe if you haven't yet so you don't miss future videos. All right, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful week, a wonderful day. Don't forget to drink your water. It's getting super hot out there. And remember that you are deeply loved and I am so glad I share the planet with you. I will be back to speak to you again very soon. <laughs> Bye.